So my name is Ryan Haar. I'm with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I am a regional private lands biologist. I'm based out of Fort Dodge, Iowa, which is the central part of the state. <clears throat> I cover 23 counties. So I go from south of Des Moines all the way to the Minnesota border and about four or five counties wide. Prior to this, I was a research scientist at Iowa State University, and that's when I was, got involved with extension and a lot, uh, uh, like Jesse Randall, Dr. Randall, who hosts the conference and those sorts of things. And in that, in that kind of part of my life, we did a lot of stuff. Most of my work was done with fire, wildlife, prairies, oak savannas, um, just all sorts of things related to that. So, you know, everything from soil biota all the way up to the big critters. And even beyond that to the socioeconomics of using fire as management tools and so forth. So, but today's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about um, using fire for wildlife management, using, using a process of fire in wildlife. And it's hard, this is a, tra uh, a talk that's hard to find a direction to go with because it's virtually impossible to go through all the different species, effects, and those sorts of things. So we're going to stick a little bit broader, a little bit more general with some of those things. And things to think about in terms of fire as a process. Okay? It's pretty frequent, the question comes up frequently that fire is bad for wildlife because stuff gets killed, right? Well, yes and no. There are certainly direct mortality events and so forth, but really, fire is a very net positive gain for most wildlife species and so forth. So, I am really good at talking really long, and I think this is probably my fourth year. I haven't been up here in a couple years. Fourth year being at Cincinnati, and I haven't made my hour yet. I've always run long, but I'm going to try and shorten that up a little bit this year and leave plenty of time for questions at the end like they mentioned. Oh man, and they did not tell me about the new rule and I was standing there in front of everybody this morning when they said, no questions from the audience, we're going to try not to go out and interact. And Ah, I hate that because I like to get out and wander around. I'm a big guy. I tend to be a pretty good door so I'll stay out of the way of this. But So if we look at this picture right here, a nice oak savanna, right? This oak savanna is coming off a burn about 60 days prior and we've already got grazers on this and so forth. Beautiful savanna, you got oak regeneration and so forth coming in there. Think about the species that are using this and how we get it there. Well, <clears throat> to get it there and to maintain it in the state that we want, we're using fire pretty frequently. Got to keep it burned back, you know, promote the regrowth and so forth. Make sure that we always have that herbaceous layer coming and that can be hard, especially in woodlots. Getting, getting where most, the state of most of our woodlots and where they are and getting them back to that state that can be easily maintained with fire that's, that mitigates damage and, and risk to wildlife and species and plants and so forth can be, can be a little bit difficult to jumpstart that process. So, I'll see right off, slide number three, I'm already going to ask a question. Jeez, interactive. The realm of practices and process. What constitutes a practice? Examples, and I'll repeat them so that they're recorded on the thing. Anybody? What's a practice? Throw a practice out there for me. You do it all the time. You pro well, okay, practice in the sense of repetitive. How about practice in the sense of land management? I should harvest. Harvest. Great. How about hinge cutting? That's a practice, right? How about um, mowing is a practice. Creating a food plot is a practice, right? Versus a process. What's a process? And I'll define these in a little bit. I'm kind of being rhetorical here a little bit, right? Processes are bigger things, bigger picture things that are typically integrated. They're integrated ecosystem services. And this is when you, if you ever hear that fancy word, I talk about ecosystem services, right? Fire is a process. Rain, the hydrologic cycle is a process. Rain comes down, percolates to the soil, moves minerals, moves nutrients, moves energy, and those sorts of things. Since the last time I got to teach, I got to teach a bunch of freshmen in college right here. Right? Photosynthesis, the basic re chemical reaction for photosynthesis. That's a process versus practices, things that we do. Right? I'm going to manage my corn plot right next to my timber in close juxtaposition to my grass so that I can move my deer, my turkeys, my quail. I can move those things around. The resources are there. I put the food plot in. So they're, they're, they're kind of separate in that. You know, practices tend to be a little bit more standalone. Are they same? Are they different? Are they related? Well, they're different but I'd say they're related. So when we talk about a practice, right, we're talking about the human application, the manipulation, you're, you're out there actively doing something, basically. The manager is doing something. Manager can be anybody. Manager can be the, you know, the city guy who's mowing the park lawn. Okay, it could be you mowing your own lawn or planting your vegetable garden. Going out, you're going out and you're actually trimming your woods back. You know, doing your, if you go to the pruning workshop, you're pruning your orchard and so, and so forth, right? Fire is a practice. So fire kind of crosses that realm, right? There are things, grazing is a practice. Grazing also crosses that realm, okay? 
Because when we think about grazing here, I think I got it there. If you think about grazing, not a, grazing itself, I'm going to put cattle, I'm going to put deer, I'm going to plan for trying to attract deer to my land with this fire because I'm going to put something they want to come eat. Okay? Grazing as herbivory, if you think about herbivory, is a process. It's the flow of materials through the system, right? The biophysical, the fancy, the fancy term, the biophysical flow of energy and materials through an ecosystem. Okay, so if we talk about grazing as a practice or fire as a practice, they can be standalone, but they also integrate, okay? Practice or processes frequently are interrelated. The hydrologic cycle drives soil processes. The hydrologic cycle drives fire cycle. How, how effective fire is going to be as a management tool is based on what's going on on some of these other things out there. Okay? Practices frequently stand alone. I go out, I plant my red clover in my deer plot, and I've got it there. The deer are going to come eat it, and I pretty much left it to go. Sort of the deal. Okay? About 1833, thereabouts, um, you know, this is, I just love these old paintings. This is George Catlin, went up the Missouri River about 30 years post Lewis and Clark, and just painted what he saw, right? And so we have all sorts of things going on here. We have fire, we have the river moving, we have, we have trees coming up from the river bank, we have wildlife moving in and out, and so forth, okay? So, but for centuries, we, and I say this being a part of it, we of European ancestry have been pretty darn good at decoupling processes from one another, taking the system apart. Right? Aldo Leopold had the great quote, the intelligent tinkerer remembers not to throw the pieces away. Okay? We always haven't been that smart in our thinking over the years, in our management of landscapes. Okay? So the challenge now is trying to return processes to the landscape. And this is tough. This is tough. Up here where we live, in this part of the Midwest, fire is just not that common a thing. Okay? It's not something that's in our lives every day. It's not something we think about. There's places in the United States where it still is, frequently. Dri anybody drive I-35 down through Kansas in, in about a month? I don't know if anybody's ever been through I-35. Right? They'll light two million acres off at once because that's what you do. Flint. What's that? Flint the Flint Hills. Yep. That's how you ranch. That's how you grow cattle. That's how, in a lot of cases, that's how they manage their wildlife, too. We're just going to light it all on fire, and it's understood that we don't care if it crosses the neighbor's property. That's good for their grass. That's good for their system, okay? So the challenge now is bringing this process of fire back, often in a novel ecosystem. And when I say, what's a novel ecosystem? We've, we've been so good at taking things apart for years that now the landscape has changed. And so when you get, you know, you can get into these kind of philosophical debates amongst yourselves and amongst, you know, I get into them with other professionals and so forth. Well, when we restore that prairie, we restore that savanna, we want to take it back to where it was in whatever year. That's hard to do because the system is not the same as it was. Soil water levels, right? The water table is far lower than it ever used to be. We've drained, we've really taken soil hydrology down. A lot of the soil is missing. We're missing a, co a whole bunch of our A horizon in a, lot of, in a lot of landscapes in this part of the Midwest. So sometimes that's, that's more difficult than you think, might think. Sometimes fire may not have been as present in that landscape. Sometimes now it has a role there. Maybe it was very present in that landscape and now it doesn't have a role there anymore. So, and so we're here to talk about well, fire is a process. That's the one we're kind of thinking about. And then the effects on wildlife. And so how do these things, if we put that thing back, if we put that fire back on our landscape, how is it going to affect wildlife? And what should we consider in that? <clears throat> All right. So the wildlife we interact with are, are they're a product. The reason they're here is because all these processes are going together. Timing, frequency, the space-time continuum, right? Ah. So we can be nerdy and we can go back to the future with it. But what we're really trying to do is return a process and attempt to restore or at least imitate that ecosystem function. Okay? You could almost take this picture out because I've been on a fire where we watched it run away and had looks like that on our face. Like, Jesus! <laughs> Just twice. <laughs> you know, two out of 300 isn't too bad or whatever. So that's a pretty, pretty good rate. So, and again, we're going back to other things that are linked. Of course, this is going to be Iocentric because that's who I work for and where I'm from and stuff. But we look at annual precipitation. This is driving the amount of growth, right? This drives the amount of growth. There's a lot of variation northwest to southeast, north to south, and so forth. We take that out of scale, go out to the United States, and we see where that is, okay? This drives fire a little bit less than it does soil biota. You know, there's evapotranspiration, some other things going on there too. But then we take a look at that map this average annual precipitation, and it corresponds pretty nicely to fire history. 
and how the communities, the habitats developed across the nation. Okay, so as we see that kind of that breakdown in precipitation coming across the Great Plains, stepping its way across Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, and kind of working our way southeasterly, you see a change in fire frequency and in habitat types. Right? So we see these things, and this is based off of, this is based off of soil. This fire history is based off of soil history. This is a Forest Service report. Okay? We can go back further and say, well, what sorts of fire were there? You know, how did fire work on this landscape and why are the wildlife we have here? Okay, this is, dendrochronology is cool stuff. Fire scar history is awesome stuff. And this is kind of hard to tell. In this one, you actually want to ignore the blue because in this, in this photo or in this uh, graphic, the blue is actually means no data, no effectual, no effectual data. But what this is, is going back and, and coring trees coring trees, especially oaks, and looking for the fire scars on them to determine the relevant frequency. And kind of the take home message is that right up here, I do have the arrow, rather I should block everybody in point, it's a green pointer. Right up here, northeast Iowa, Wisconsin, the Mississippi, northern uh, the Mississippi Valley up there, okay, we're still looking at somewhere, historically, on average, somewhere between 10 and 15 year fire return interval. Fire return interval that was, that was, and I should make the further step, that was solid enough to, that was intense enough to leave a scar on the oak tree, okay? We'll talk about mitigating intensity here. So, so we've come a long way in returning, we, we do. We're all here because, I should ask at the beginning, how many people have been on a fire? Okay, you've lit a fire yourself, you burned your land and so forth. This is, we, all of us are here, we're thinking about that, okay? So we've come a long way in our understanding returning the process to at least small portions of the landscape. And we see that missing that, we get things like invasion, right? We see inv endangered, or, uh, uh, invasive species, red cedar, the grass that's underlying this is all tall fescue that's taken over prairie and, and, and those sorts of things. And part of the reason those are there is a product of not having fire on the landscape. This changes the wildlife community that will be there. By the time you get to this stage where those cedars are that big, and that's not that old a cedar, okay, you've completely disrupted a grass under oak savanna landscape for the wildlife that will use it. This becomes, you know, I talk to deer hunters all the time. You know, we, I know a bunch of out-of-state guys who are just thrilled with the fact that they got 60 acres of dense cedar, okay? That's awesome for my deer hunting until you can't see 20 feet through it. And then what good is it? And then you can't get fire under it. And then you've lost any potential for grazing revenue. You've lost the value for grassland woods, for birds, for uh, grassland birds, for hardwood oak savanna birds, and those sorts of things too, okay? Now the timing, frequency, and effects of, fi of fire on wildlife and endangered species. Now, now that we're getting more fire on the landscape, we have to start thinking of these kind of next level, this sort of first and secondary um, level fire impacts to, to the populations of, of critters that are out there. So. Everything we live in is kind of a disturbance-dependent system, right? We don't often think about them as such, but everything that we live in in our landscape, be it grassland, be it woodland, be it savanna, is a, is a disturbance-dependent system. In most cases, as we've just seen with the fire scar history and stuff like that, a lot of that historically was driven by fire, okay? There are distinct communities within larger landscapes, depending on some of these processes that are going on, you know, hydric music, xeric soils, it has to do with soil hydrology and the flow of water and so forth through there. You know, is it C3 grass community, C4 grass community? Oak woodlands tended to have a, a cool season grass community in that they were sedge dominated. And sedge are, sedges are grasses. They're, they're a member of the grass family. They're all graminoids, right? How many of you could go out and say you have a healthy sedge community in your oak wood lot? It's tough, isn't it? It's tough, but that's what was really driving a lot of that, okay? That, that was the herbaceous layer in there and a lot of that. There are, there, and I'll refer to her, there's a place called Timber Hill Savannah in southern, in, in southern Iowa. And it's owned by, by a, a couple, a retired couple, and they burn all the time. Sometimes three times a year they burn their entire property. They have like 46 species of sedge. They have so many sedges that there aren't enough professors in the Midwest to identify all the sedges that are growing there. And they didn't plant them. They just started clearing stuff, they started burning a lot, and that's what came back. Okay? And uh, there's going to be pictures of it in here, and the, the undergrowth, whereas this is all grass, which you'd see in the pictures coming up, this will, that's not really grass, it's all sedge. And that's what, you know, that's an important wildlife food resource. There have been studies in the debates out there, you know, geez, do we, do we, can we understand critters in the modern sense and so forth? But bison, up to 95% of their, their diet for seven months of the year is sedge-based. They're extremely, you know, some of those species were extremely tied to sedge communities. Okay. 
So practices, remember those single things that we do, may have effects on each of these different layers within the ecosystem, your herbaceous layer, your mid-story layer, your, your, your upper level layer, okay? You know, you can do TSI, you can do crop tree release and those sorts of things. But single practices alone, repeat, done repeatedly, tend to override processes and drive your community in one way, okay? So if you do the same thing repeatedly, and this goes for fire too, fire is a practice, not a process. If you do the same thing over and over and over again, you're gonna drive away a lot of things, okay? What happens, classic, I work for the Iowa DNR, and most agencies are the same way. When do we burn? We burn in March, April, and May, right? That's when we burn our prairies. What happens when we burn our prairies every three years? We drive them to being grass dominated. We drive the forbs out of them, okay? Spring fire promotes heavy duty grass regrowth and it suppresses forb regrowth. Think about what that matters then if you're thinking about, thinking about brood rain habitat for birds, for pheasants, for quail, for some of those things that maybe are kind of the popular game species, okay? If we drive out the brood rearing cover, we make them think those things less valuable, okay? So goals as landowners, I won't interact because I'm not supposed to, but you know, we have varied goals, lots of varied goals. Habitat, floral resources and diversity, maybe hunting and recreation. This is a big one now, is gaining popularity, right? And it's in the news a lot, we're gonna talk about it. Um, pollinators is wildlife and service providers, okay, pollinators. Maybe you're a beekeeper and you're, and you're interested in the honey making capacity. Maybe you're an orchard owner, okay? Maybe you're a soybean farmer and you don't realize that actually butterflies pollinate up to 25% of Iowa's soybean crop every year. So now all of a sudden when we have some of these neonics out there and we kill the butterflies, then maybe we just inhibited our ability to properly pollinate our soybean crop every year. Okay, so that's a bigger growing thing. Invasive species management. Agriculture, you know, using fire to drive your grazing processes. Okay, silviculture, you're trying to regrow oak woodlands and so forth. Right? Fire is important for all these things, can be used for all these things, but critical to always have well-defined goals in mind so you know what you're trying to accomplish when you're putting that fire back on there. Okay, I love, Ryan, I think it's Ryan Kroll from Iowa Department of Agriculture. I love the title of his talk, so I had to steal it for this slide at least. Know what works in your landscape and what are you trying to get with it? Where are you trying to go there, right? Be it greater yellow legs, be it coyotes. Think about where you occupy. What do you do on your landscape? Okay, are you the top level carnivore? Are you out there taking two, three deer a year off and that's your meat source and so forth? But who fills the other niches? Who's out there? Who are the scavengers? Who are your recyclers? Do you have a healthy dung beetle population in your woodlot? Okay, it's interesting, that's a big deal. It's, no one ever hears about that, but why would dung beetles be a big deal? Well, obviously because they're out there recycling poo, right? How many people have a dog? How many treat that dog for flies or ticks or anything else? Okay, so we all do that. How many people raise cattle? Anybody, anybody got cattle? We treat them, I've got some calves, I keep 4-H calves, we grow them up to about 1,000 pounds, butcher them out, right? What do we treat them? We treat them with ivermectin, right? Ivermectin to keep flies and parasites off them. Guess what ivermectin does? Kills off all the dung beetles. So when that poo goes out there, all that ivermectin is transferred to the, to the animal poo and you kill off your dung beetle populations. Those are important nutrient cyclers. In grassland and woodland landscapes, a lot of that nitrogen that just gets out the backside of a northbound coyote or whatever, you know, that is recycled by dung beetles and put back into the system. So there's a process that's all of a sudden missing. So, so it's all those different things that are going on in your landscape. So get familiar with what does inhabit your land. What's out there? What do you want to be out there, right? Lots of landowners have a good feel for what's out there. Take an inventory. Just go for a walk about a few times, a, a few times a year and see what's growing at different times a year, okay? And then think about what you want to see using your property. So. Talk a little bit about wildlife. So you are here, right? Cincinnati Mound. <clears throat> I had to zoom this out quite a bit because of privately protected information. This is Iowa DNRs and this is internal so you guys can't, I can't show it to you, sorry. If, if you give, come to me with your property, I could show it to you. But this is zoomed out enough to not be identifiable. This is the location, uh, known locations of threatened and endangered species, federal and state, in Northeast Iowa, right? Those are known locations of all the state and federal listed endangered species in the state. The orange dots being bald eagles, bald eagle nests. Okay? The yellow dots being critters, the green dots being plants. If we zoom in on somebody's property in particular, it's just random. Oh, dang it. <laughs> right in the front row, too. I got his. This is just random, okay? There's a lot of things going on here. You have uh, 
that's actually a bat. That's a northern, a northern long-eared bat, which is a, is a candidate species in about two weeks. is probably going to be an official listed threatened federal species, and that's going to affect technically all of us, but especially those of us who work for agencies. We will have to plan all our fires around northern long-eared bat. Okay? We've had to do it in southern Iowa for a while now with the Indiana bat, kind of the, the cousin. You know, so in this place, if you were to manage this property with fire, you've got some stuff going on here. If you're cognizant of what you've got, oh, where's my pointer? Okay, an eagle nest up there, right? Technically, under the Bald Eagle Act, we're not supposed to do anything, including fire and so forth, any time between January and September, because it could disrupt a nesting bald eagle and cause nest abandonment. Will it? Very likely not, right? We burn under eagle nests all the time, and they don't really care. Um, Northern long-eared bat very susceptible during, when they're in their maternal colonies to being impacted by smoke, really. It's actually smoke that causes problems for them less than, because they're up in a tree. You know, they're up under the bark in a tree a ways. But it can be smoke impacts that cause problems for these. You have two different things, and this is interesting. I don't know, I don't remember what species this is, but these are two plants. So if you're thinking, you know, just this parcel down the fence line there and back up to the creek, and just think that little area, you want to burn that wood lot. You've got an eagle nest, you've got an endangered bat, and this is actually an endangered grass record, of, or a grass or sedge, I'm not sure, but it's indicative that this didn't used to probably be closed forest. This is a record from about 1955 when this grass was found out there. Okay, it was, it's only found in savannas. Well, this is now closed canopy oak, oak forest, and so the probability is, is that grass isn't there anymore, at least blooming. It may still will be, well be in the seed bank and so forth, um, but think about what the fire is going to do. If we open that up, maybe fire brings that back. Right. How's fire going to work on your landscape? You know, different times of the year. This is the leaf off uh, color infrared image, okay, morphs into the fall image. You know, there's different fuels and things available at different times of the year. There are seasonal changes. Where are wildlife on your farm at different times of the year? There's certainly migratory things. Things are moving across the country and coming in. Indiana bat is one we have to worry a lot about. Indiana bat is a migratory bat. It only comes to Iowa for about six months, has its young, and then it goes, and they all go roost in like six caves in Kentucky. The entire population goes to like six caves in Kentucky, and then they spread out across the Midwest, and then they go back. Okay, so at this different times of the year, we have bats out there that we have to worry about. Okay, we can burn. We can burn at this time of the year just fine and not worry about them because they're not around with leaf off. By the time we get into leaf on, and that is getting to be more and more of a thing, summer growing season burns, um, we do have to worry about them. Indiana bat, we can't burn until after September 30th in, in our state managed, our government managed timbers because we could impact them well before they've left the maternal colonies. Okay, <clears throat> How's the landscape going to work? If we took it that same, we used the, uh, the high def one meter hill shade, okay, um, topography, you know, north side versus south side. Cool fires, cool fires that critters can survive versus hot fires on the south facing slopes. Cool, cool fires on the north facing slopes, fires that don't happen very often. Right? Your north facing slope may only require a fire every 10 to 15 years. Your south facing slope may be every two to three. Okay? It's just differences on the side of the hill, the differences across the hilltop. And there's different critters that occupy different sides. So fire is an efficient practical tool for maintaining habitats that we've often put a lot of time into. Probably most of us are here because we've done a lot of those practices out there. We've done tree clearing, we've used fire, we've done those herbicide applications to try and get it where we want it. Okay? Without more things, and that's why a process tends to be a little bit more efficient, right? Lack of fire um, tends to cause de degradation and expense to those things that we put a lot of time into. This is kind of, it's not really time lapse, it's actually three, three pictures within a kilometer of each other. These are two-year-old cedars that you can hardly see. The, the landowner here worked hard to get grassland. They sold it to an outstate hunter who bought it for quail hunting, okay? It's been in CRP, they renovated it, they put it in the natives. This is a two or three-year-old cedar planting. Same thing, less than a mile away or not cedar planting, cedar invasion, excuse me. Same thing, cedar's about a mile away. These are only eight years old. These are 25 years old. So it rapidly progresses, and now we've completely lost what we were working for for a while. So, But applying fire is as much art as science, and this is kind of where we're going to get into talking about some of the, the effects and the mitigation for wildlife. A quick refresher on basic firing techniques. I probably don't have to go through this, but I will. Quickly, a backfire, right, moving against the wind or the dominant slope. Moves more slowly, more complete combustion. Head fires, driven by the wind, incomplete combustion, they leave more residue, and that's key when you're thinking about critters and so forth. They can be very intense, but they tend to be fast moving and get over with pretty quickly. Flank fires is kind of a combination of the two. They're moving perpendicular to the wind. 
right? They pull heat into the smoke in the center of the unit and can, and can protect the edges a little bit more. Spot ignition, we're not going to talk a lot about in this context. But so if we talk about a backfire, the wind direction is going against it, right? Fire movement is backing into the wind, very slow. Think about how critters would respond to that, how that can be a mitigating technique. Head fire, simply moving with the wind, okay? Fire is driven by the wind or driven by the slope, moving with it very quickly, very intense. Flank, wind may be moving this way, it's moving from the due west, but we're burning it off and letting it burn off perpendicular. Yeah, maybe my arrows will go, there we go. Okay, so we start thinking about wildlife and these different firing techniques and how to mitigate, okay? A lot of big things that we think about get out of the way. Bison are awesome. I have a chance to burn with the Fish and Wildlife Service where they have a lot of bison on a big, on a big preserve and so forth. They're fun because they, they don't care. They've been like, you know what? We've been dealing with fire for 200,000 years. We don't, we don't care. You know, we'll light right up to the edge of the bowls while they're just laying there. And they don't, until the fire gets to about 10 feet from them, they're like, God, and they gotta, now we gotta move. And they'll get up. But we can, we can be burning a head fire across this and they'll finally get up when that fire is less than the room from them. Even that thing may be cooking and roaring across the grass and landscape. They just, it's like, whatever, we've dealt with it for millennia, okay? So a lot of species, birds, big critters, have the ability to get up and get out and move, right? So they have the, they have the ability to move or utilize other escape mechanisms. It's really interesting. Fire is a, a crazy thing. As hot as that fire is, there's research out there that if you go less than an inch, well, about an inch, subsurface on, you know, on a, on a backfire, on a head fire, on different, you know, different temperatures, different residence times, and so forth, one inch below the soil surface, the temperature goes up one degree Celsius. Even though that, th that fire may be burning along at 1400 degrees or more, subsurface, that, that soil is a fantastic insulator, okay? And so if, you have, if critters can get below ground, they're not gonna be burned in heat, you know, the heat intensity. Oxygen depletion may be a different thing, but typically actually in the subsurface level, that's not that big a deal. So one in if that critter can get underground one inch below the surface, they're probably gonna have minimal impact to their health and safety. It's things like, it's the things that can't get away that we worry a little bit more about. Herps are a big deal, okay? You know, so direct and indirect mortality does occur, and so for things like herps, smooth green snake here, those things we are a little bit more concerned about. Can we do things to, to kind of mitigate for that? Um, and so allowing for refugia is a nef necessary consideration. So refugia, defined. Just a place for animals or, or people, but technically animals, to get away, you know, so that they can get into that, that'll be safe. How can we provide them a, spa a spot and space and time for them to get away from the effects of fire? Okay, so we're going to talk about refugia in time with seasonality. Okay, sometimes it's as simple as just, you know, you have a goal for your woodlot, but you're concerned about the critters that are out there, the wildlife that's out there. Sometimes it's as simple as just delaying it until after they've migrated. Okay? They'll move seasonally. Animals move seasonally. Okay? There are uh, Kirtland's warblers, an interesting case. It's up in Michigan, right? They, use, they migrate horizontally during the year. They start the season very low in the canopy. Mid-season, mid they're higher in the canopy. In the end of the season, they're actually at the top of the tree canopy. And they, they're a jack pine sort of, sort of um, um, obligate species. And so, but they'll get up to different places within the canopy. So late in the season, a slow-moving low intensity ground fire will not really be that dangerous to that bird. But early in the season, the same thing may be dangerous to that bird. So just thinking about giving them time seasonally, okay, what moves in and out seasonally, can also mitigate your fire effects too, like your, your fire danger and so forth. Timing of fire criticals all these things. So if we consider season of use, Indiana bat, talked about him a little bit, okay, he's, he's coming in in September, or coming in, excuse me, in April and leaving in September. And they're migrating in and out. So we can time our fires around them to avoid impacts. Uh, we won't touch on the monarch right now. This little guy, anybody know what this is? It's a turtle, obviously, but it's a wood turtle, okay? Wood turtles are something, we have an interesting project going on in, in one of the counties I work in where we're, we're going to start using more fire. Wood turtles are a river bottom oak savanna obligate. There is virtually no river bottom oak savanna left anymore. So you're talking river bottom prairies on big flat river systems. In Iowa, it would be like in the Wapsipinicon River system, the Cedar River system, those things that just tend to be kind of big, muddy systems, but with oaks in them. Fire was critical to maintaining the habitat to them. The only reason that they're still around is because there for a county, people didn't, in, in that one county area on this one stretch of river, people didn't pull their cattle off until about the 80s, and there was actually still some fire going on in the 50s, so those woodlands hadn't completely closed in yet, and that's why they're left. However, so we want to burn and do situations like this, 
as soon as the ambient air temperature on an average daily basis hits 58 degrees, those turtles are a land-based turtle. They come out of the water and they stay on land. And they'll stay out until it hits 58 degrees again, basically, in the fall. And so if we're burning, yeesh, after March, well, of course, seasons just seem to be warming up and cooling down at different times. We went straight from 20 below to 70 last week, it seemed like. You know, so we missed that, that whole spring. But there's a window there that we kind of, if we're worried about fire for these critters to try and get the prairie back, those bottomland oak savanna hardwood forests that have grass and stuff in them, we have to be very careful about when we're putting that fire on. Duck nest up here, right? They, they actually protected it, and I think all they did is really, they probably just would have been better off burning the nest up because now you know, you're just attracting predators and that sort of thing, but burn around the nesting season. Anybody who has CRP and has gotten their letter from FSA that you need to do your mid-contract management, when's the last day you can do that? May 15th, right? May 15th is the federal cutoff if you have CRP when you can burn because after that things are nesting. Refuge in time, day and night, especially at the fringes of our burden season. Herps and those things tend to go into hibernacula at night. So if you're worried about the turtle and things, boy, it's been about 60 degrees for a couple days. That turtle may be out. It's still not warm enough at night for that turtle to want to be out. They're going to go back to the water in the evening. Burn at night. Okay? Burn, after, burn, burn towards dark when things have moved back into water sources or those, or, or those other protection mechanisms. Okay? In time, refuge in time, refuge in time, and this takes a little bit to get to it, but when you burn pretty frequently through your oak woodlands and so forth, the fires that come through then are very, you've re re reduced the intensity, excuse me. You've taken the intensity of those fires. Those first few when you've got lots of logs and lots of litter and things built up after 30 years, that fire is going to, if you get it on a dry day, that thing's going to cook and you're going to have logs releasing BTUs for a long time. Okay? You get into a cycle here like this open wood lot, now we light a fire and that thing just kind of, it's really low intensity, it's cool in a relative sense. It's very cool fire, it moves slowly, doesn't cause too many problems, gives critters a lot more chance to move and adapt to it, okay? In space, this is kind of, I say in situ, right? So on your burn unit, delaying it a while. This is important for pollinators. This is an important thing we're finding for pollinators. Delay your fire until it starts to get really green or burn it when it's been really, really wet. Because that fire is pain in the butt, the smoke is very acrid when things get green and wet and it'll burn your lungs and nose more. But on this spot right here, we had the biggest flush of regal fritillaries off this piece that we'd seen in years. Regal fritillaries is a little butterfly, a specialist butterfly that lives on prairie flowers, right? And they overwinter, they reside, their larvae reside in the, fuel, in the litter, in the grass litter. So if you burn all that off, you, you know, and, and really cook it, you're going to cook all their larvae and kind of kill them. This sort of thing, we burned this late in April. I don't know if, if some of my crew were on this in the past or not. But this one, actually, we had a huge emergence of regal fritillaries off this piece because a lot of these pieces just didn't burn. It skunked around through there. It was a pretty wet day when we burned it, right? So there's a lot of refuge, refuge left right there. Ex situ, so off the situation or off the site. This one, we've just cut it, we divide our burn units off. So there's actually a whole other spot for them. They don't have to, you know, they have to leave the area because this is a pretty intense fire. But there's a whole other spot for the, for the wildlife to bail into and get into and get away from. Still the habitat they want at that time of year, but we've left it so that they can get into it. Okay? Techniques, we talked about backfire, right? It's slow. It's a slow, for, it's more complete. It's going to take that, that fuel layer all the way down to the mineral soil. It's more complete combustion, but it's slower and it gives those slow moving things, the herptofauna, um, some of your arthropods and things, a chance to move away from that fire, that oncoming fire. <clears throat> Believe it or not, head fires actually can be used successfully, and this isn't a grass situation, but where my igniter here, where she's come down, 50 yards behind her, the fire's already out. So you've got about a five second residence time there. It's hot and it's fast and she's moving pretty quick because that's coming down behind her. But really about five or 10 seconds later, the fire's already burned out behind her. So it's moved pretty quickly. Moving very quickly, it's not penetrating deep into the litter layer. So it's not penetrating deep into the litter layer and we're protecting some of those things that might have gotten below ground. Um, we're protecting those things that may be overwintering in an egg stage in the, in the litter. <clears throat> and this is where you can kind of see this. I don't know how all this shows up. Sorry, I'm in your way a lot over here. Okay, this is where you can see this. You can actually see what's going on here. There's kind of a, a seep on the hillside here. You can see where the backfires come through and burned very intensely. That's the dark, dense black, right? Once we had our backfires in, we came around to the bottom of the hill and let the head fire up north, okay? And you can see there's a lot more litter there, okay? So we've actually, 
we've actually changed, the, there's different, different community combustions here. The, the, some of that stuff that's just fallen over and not been completely combusted. Move fast enough through that, hit, some, hit the seep and stopped, and we've got a protected re refuge up top. So there's actually a couple different things going on there. Same sort of thing here. Backfire through the road ditch until we let the head fire go across the green field. It hopped, right? This stuff, this was all this green, basically, this road ditch prior to it. The ditch burned very completely with the backfire. We took it down to the soil. That's all just very fine ash now. This up here is messy. That's messy. And ecologically, for wildlife, that's actually very good. We've left refuge in there. The fire's moved on pretty quickly. Okay? Even within species, or within, not species, within families, so the butterfly family, all things are not created equal. So you want to know what you got out there. This goes back to what's lurking in your landscape when I want to go out there. Okay, four different butterflies respond to fire four different ways. The regal fritillary is dependent on prairie violets and then some of the asclepias, the milkweeds and so forth, for nectaring, but especially dependent on the violets. Violets are very, they're fire increasers. They like fire. But if you burn too frequently or too intensely, you kill the larvae off. So you have to burn and leave refuge so that you burn and re restore the, the food resource that they need, but you don't kill the butterfly off. The Edwards hair streak, it goes out, it nectars, it lays its eggs, and the caterpillars and so forth go out into the prairie, but then they leave the grass and go back into the timber in the evenings. Okay, and they actually over, spend overnight and so forth under, under bark on trees. So if you burn, you know, think about what time of day you're burning in, okay? <clears throat> Power sheet skipperling is something that's just been federally listed as endangered. Um, in Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, well, everywhere, it's federally endangered. Um, the population just completely blinked out after 2010. It was spread from the Dakotas into Iowa, southern Minnesota, a little bit in Wisconsin, a little bit in Michigan. Every population except for three counties in Wisconsin blinked out in 2010. And so it just disappeared from all its range. It is very, very fire sensitive because it only only can reside in high quality native prairie remnants with certain flowers and things there. Okay, and so it just, boop, it just blinked. It just disappeared. Every, there's been people going to the places it's been found for 50 years and they can't find it anymore since 2010, except for like three places in Wisconsin. And this is the big one that's coming. Okay, in about a year, probably, the federal government's going to consider listing, they're going to list the monarch as a, as, a <clears throat> as a candidate species for the Endangered Species Act. Um, if you haven't followed it and so forth, the monarch is about, it's on the verge of blinking out, although 2015 was a good monarch year. We've lost 95, 97% of our monarchs since 2002. So in basically in, in 10 or 12 years, we've lost almost all, all the monarchs in, in the country. This is an interesting guy for fire because if we're doing late, right, they, need, they need flowers. They're, you know, especially the milkweeds, you know, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, world green, all those different species of milkweed and so forth. But they nectar on other flowers as well. To keep those forbs going, I mentioned earlier on, I'll talk about it in a slide here too in a minute. Fall fire, late summer and fall fire really promotes forbs and flowers, right? Typically, fire is not an issue for monarchs because they are so common. They are common as starlings a few, until just you know, about two years ago when they crashed um, that it was never really a concern. Now it is because if we want to try and push our, our flower growth so that we have butterfly habitat, we want to burn that in the summer and fall. That's right when these things are starting to move and migrate. Right? They're still coming out of their chrysalis, their caterpillar stage, in that late August time frame, and now it's a little bit more of a concern. Okay. <clears throat> summer and fall fires tend to hurt grasses and promote forbs. Dormant season fires tend to promote and invigorate grasses. Right now, we're in the dormant season. So burns from now until about, well, to now until mid-May, you're going to really boost your grasses, a shot in the arm to grasses. Summer, fall, you know, August, September fires tend to really sap grass, sap the energy out of grasses, but really boost forbs, because most forms have already senesced, forbs have senesced for the season already. And so you're, you're actually hurting the root system and the energy reserves of grasses and boosting it for forbs. Both are very good goals, and both have a lot of wildlife benefits, depending on what you want. Do you want good, hunter, you know, do you want good cover to hunt pheasants in in the, in the winter? You're probably wanting to use spring fire. Are you more concerned about, I want to produce pheasants and other birds? Probably better use fall fire, because it drives things different ways. Both are valid goals. Each has potential drawbacks, because you're going to hurt, some, at some point, there's going to be a trade-off. Okay? Temporary loss of thermal cover in the winter and summer. Okay? out in the plains where they burn so much in Kansas, this is, oh geez, I went forward, there we go. It's burned so much, the problem is that prairie chickens are crashing in Kansas because they burn too much. Not because the fire is killing the prairie chicken and baking all their nests off, 
But because in the middle of Kansas through July, it gets to be 110 degrees every day. The only place that they have for shade is like plum thickets and draws and those sorts of things. They burn so much that they have no shrub cover left. And so they're th it's actually opposite. They have nowhere to get out of the sun. And they're actually so thermally stressed they start dying. So we've burned too much in that sense. Okay? Burn, you know, if you're a hunter, if, you know, there are certainly wildlife species that do favor um, eastern red cedar. You know, some, some of us, you know, we have a little bit of a concern with our pheasant biologists in Iowa promoting that you have to plant red cedar all over all this new pheasant safe CRP practice. Yeesh. But then cedar takes over everything, you know, so it's a trade-off there. But honestly, if you burn it up, you've taken away a winter cover sort of thing. Same thing if we go out and we burn our cattail marsh, we take away significant winter cover. <clears throat> Increased risk of uh, predation risk, you know, if, if your goal is, I want more predators on my landscape, right, it's great for predators. Anybody ever done a, uh, like a grass fire? And this is hard to see, I tried to get a picture of it a few years ago. That's actually, that's a, um, a harrier. She's got something in her sights and she's actually diving on it into the fire. But if you ever burn, you ever just notice how many hawks show up? Suddenly you have, right, they queue on the smoke plume because all of a sudden prey is going to be readily available and hunting is going to be easier. It's great for the predator, not so great for the prey. That rabbit got toasted, literally, twice, right? She got, <laughs> she got burned, and the hawk got her. The same thing here. This is a picture from, I, I found this somewhere. I think it's a, a, a Fish and Wildlife or BLM picture where they, they burned off, they found the duck nest, so they quick put a wet line around it and protected the duck nest. Like, essentially, what they did is just put a big target on it <laughs> for every coyote or whatever that's out there, that every egg predator that's out there, skunks and so forth. They're like, hey, yeah, exactly, eat here, right? So, you know... <laughs> Again, thinking about what, you're, what the effects that, um, the indirect effects that you're going to have. You may not have toasted the nest, but indirectly you've probably cost, cost the, uh, the, the, the predation effect on it anyways. Okay. Food. Food resources. You know, this is a, this is, um, a plot we did. This is a fall fire. Look at it. I mean, the blazing star and everything coming back through. There's tons of room for chicks to move. This was a quail management fire, so chicks are moving in and out of there. Seed and flowering resources have been boosted. If you're thinking about oak woodlands, fire doesn't necessarily make oaks produce more acorns and mass and so forth, but it increases the, the, the availability of it. So if you actually get through, you burn through that leaf litter layer, you're actually attracting things. There's folks um, that love to hunt turkeys over fresh, wood, fresh woodland burns. On that grassland burn, you burn into your woods a little bit, you've taken the leaf litter off, your acorns are exposed. It's a fantastic place for spring turkey hunting. Turkeys are drawn in to, to burnovers, right? When it's been burned over, that's a nice place to go hunt. Increased arthropod, bug availability. So those things that you're worried about getting out there, you're growing your chicks in the spring, um, you know, making sure that you have, you know, a, a situation like this with all those flowers has really diverse um, um, insect diversity, okay? In this part of the country, and even as you move a little bit further north, okay? Aspen are clonal, right? So for rough grouse, aspen are clonal and fire before the advent of forestry mowers and all the big things and chainsaws and stuff like that fire is what maintained aspen communities in a state that if you if you take off your 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 sub 30 year aspen forest class your rough grouse are going to disappear because you've completely lost the only place they rear the, they do they take their broods after nesting once the broods have hatched they go into that kind of that kind of like hair on a dog's back you know super thick Aspen regrowth. That's where they rear their they rear their chicks. If that whole age class of aspen disappears, okay, you've lost suitable habitat and they're going to go elsewhere. And that's part of the problem. That's part of a big part of the identified problem. Like at least in northeast Iowa, I don't know the situation in Wisconsin, Minnesota, in northeast Iowa, all of our aspen is 35 to 40 years old at least. And we don't have many of those really young stands. And so they're just, they're just, there's nowhere to go and raise the kids. So they're kind of blinking out. So in a, you know, in a, in a you can certainly manage that with, with a forestry cutter and so forth. But also, if you, if you can get into a fire cycle and keep that regrowth going, every few years you burn that aspen stand back. Aspen is super susceptible to fire damage. It'll die back. But it's clonal out of its roots. And so even though you burn the top off, it'll re-sprout very vigorously from its roots. And pretty quickly, you'll have, you'll have about a six-foot stand of just thick, thick aspen. Okay? Other indirect effects. Once you burn, wildlife are going to come into that property pretty quickly. So you got to think about what do you want there, because you're going to get deer. Deer are going to show up pretty quick after the fire. You get that regrowth. This happens to be cattle. We know that cattle will spend 80% of their time grazing. If, you, if you've burned off part of your pasture, they'll ignore everything else, and they'll spend 80% of their grazing time right there. Happens with turkeys, happens with deer. 
happens with elk, Arkansas and southern Missouri, where they've actually reintroduced elk into the Ozarks and so forth, have started burning their glades for a number of reasons, because the glade prairies in the Ozarks have been overgrown, but they're actually really diverse native prairies. Guess where the elk want to hang out on that recently burned glade, right? Fresh forage. It's just kind of a model of that, you know, different things that you can use to move a fire around and track that. And now, there we go. Maybe. It's stuck on me. I don't know what's going on. And my battery might be dying. There we go. Okay, take home points. Continue to think about the process. Once you start putting those things out there, you start putting fire in, especially in a system, you start using it repeatedly, okay, you start to, you start to restart that process and let that thing get back going and let the ecology kind of take over there. Make sure you have an increased awareness of the habitat and species residing in your parcel though and what that, when you start reintroducing fire, what that's gonna do. You know, you don't wanna burn up all your turkey nests. Okay? You, don't wanna, you don't wanna negatively impact some of those things if at all possible. You wanna provide, somehow provide refuge, provide space for critters to go at different times of the year, different times of the day, um, different years, amongst years, for them to go so that you keep, that pro keep them on your property, <clears throat> okay? Consider your goals, how you, can do the, how you can achieve them without doing undue harm. And the fact is, is that there are trade-offs. Okay? When we do burn, we talked about that. If you burn in the spring versus burn in the fall, you burn your wood, you know, wood lots tend to burn far better in the fall. Right? So if you burn them in the fall, there's going to be certain trade-offs. Not as many, but it, versus burning them in the spring. Oak woodlands are harder to burn in the spring than they are in the fall. Right? And one thing, talking about, you know, where we do practice these and processes, and I talked about this. Now, this is, this is completely, this is a nice rule of thumb that a friend of mine in the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy uses a lot. Don't do the same thing twice. I hit on it a little earlier. Okay, when we use the same thing two years in a row or more years in a row, those practices tend to override the process, and we drive the community a certain way. And really, it becomes diversity. It's just like diversifying your assets, right? You want a diverse portfolio in your retirement assets or whatever. Same thing. You don't sink all your money into one thing year after year. You want a diverse amount of habitats, diverse number of practices and processes going on uh, on your land and your property over, over several years. A, a neat rule of thumb, make sure everything gets the chance to bloom every two to three years. Okay? Make sure everything has a the ability to go to seed every two to three years. Okay? So your shrubs and, and different things. Even your cedars, if you're concerned about that, make sure that your cedars have an opportunity to produce juniper berries and those sorts of things every couple of years. Okay? There's information. I don't even know where I said it. I thought I brought them upstairs. Um, Iowa State has got a whole series of new publications out. There's this new one here that's called Timing a Prescribed Burn, and it talks about different wildlife, different invasive species, when you might want to time burns, what you'll affect, what you won't affect, and so forth at those at different times of the year, and when's a good time to try and target honeysuckle or target cedar or attract pheasants or, or move turkey and those sorts of things. These are all available online. I swear I brought a pile of them up with me, but I might not have. We have them downstairs in the main lobby too. If anybody wants them, I can, I can get you a copy of these. We've got all, I don't have the fire and grazing one because we talk about wildlife a little bit that one. There's also a new one called burning for um, oak regeneration. And that one is out now too because burning is very important for oak regeneration actually. Um, just that same sort of thing that makes the oak acorns more available to wildlife. It also allows sunlight to penetrate and cause those, oaks to, those acorns to germinate better. And so you can actually enhance, enhance your oak, oak regrowth with fire. So with that, I don't even know how, much, how long I went. But, oh man, I actually made it shy of an hour. Good job. So we can take questions there. Yeah. What caused the monarch uh, disappearance of back in 2002? Yep, so his question is, What's kind of one of the, th what's causing that, that loss of monarchs? What's causing monarchs to fall off the map? The really quick and short, uh, the quick and short answer is that Roundup is a fantastic chemical. <laughs> We've also lost almost all of our common milkweed. Those people who actually go out and weed commissioners and so forth that worry about common milkweed report almost zero on the landscape anymore. That's a big part of it. The other, there's, I mean, there's several things. You know, we've lost our milkweeds. <clears throat> um, they also tend to winter, they overwinter, they all fly to northern Mexico in about I don't know, a dozen different kind of major colonies in, in, in northern Mexico. And so one, we've kind of eliminated all their resources to reproduce on up here, and then when they go to Mexico, about half or more of those colonies have been developed in the last 10 years. So they're kind of taking it at both ends. There's no place to go live in the winter, 
and they're not reproducing in the summer. And so that's kind of the hypothesis right now. Um, there's been some other, there's probably some other, there's certainly, not probably, there's certainly other factors at play. They're just parsing this out right now. So. It's going to be difficult to turn back, yep. Now, we have Roundup Ready soybeans. I found out last night we have Roundup Ready cottonwood. <laughs> and the forestry, the forestry guys were telling me last night there's Roundup Ready cottonwood. You know, there are proposals out there to make Roundup Ready milkweed. <laughs> so, are, there, are there monarchs in Europe in other parts of the world? Are there monarchs in Europe and other parts of the world? No, there's related species, but they're not the same species that we have. Well, I was going to ask. A surrogate. Yep. Nope. So, yeah, question. When you do a burn and you're expecting the grass to come back from wherever it was, mm -hmm. like in your garden when you have yep. weeds coming, yep. are all these seeds just blowing around the wind all the time? Or are they in the ground? Okay. Where do they come from? Good question. The question is, when you do the burn and you're dealing with grasses or your garden or whatever, where do the seeds come from to get that regrowth? Excuse me. Typically, it's in the seed bank. Okay. The thing... A big concern for us in northern Iowa when we burn is that the fact that like Canada thistle seed is out there blowing around everywhere and that can be a concern when you open up that ground and you expose it boy it just doesn't take long for seed Canada thistle to start growing on that pretty quick in general it comes from the seed bank that's, that's grown from the seeds that are in the soil and I didn't I talk about it, I think I talk about it in my next talk this later this afternoon you know there are there are there can be concerns typically especially if you're burning brush piles down that you could actually sterilize any seeds that are left in the soil and you can actually impact the seed bank that way but that's that's intense heat for a long time that can cause those problems but in general those seed banks are coming that that's coming from seed banks in the soil that regrowth so yeah in the back with that in mind uh, if you burn, let's say, the first time and you end up with a lot of weeds like Canada thistle, mm -hmm. would, it be, would it be good then to burn more often for a while just to, ex to uh, reduce the mm -hmm. So his question is, you know, if you do do that burn and you do end up with some species, some weeds, things that you don't want, would it be good to continue burning or try and keep burning? And the answer is in general, yes. Um, you can impact a lot of those invasive species. They're early successional species, and they're taking over because there's nothing else there, right? Nature abhors a vacuum. Something's going to take over if you've got bare space. The, the difficulty tends to, so, so those invasive species tend to be fire intolerant, okay? They tend to be fire intolerant. The difficulty with a lot of our invasive species is that once you burn them, because they're fire intolerant, they don't have some of those properties that actually, they don't put on a lot of biomass. The problem is actually having enough fuel to burn repeatedly, year after year after year. Multiflora rose is a pain in the butt once it gets established. It is not fire tolerant. You can burn multiflora rose, and if you burn it about three years in a row, you'll kill it. It's actually, it takes a couple fires to kill it back. But the problem is, is once you burn it the first time, it comes back and then it, nothing grows under it. And so to get it to burn again, you don't have any grass, you don't have any leaves, anything under it to get the fire through it again. And so that's the challenge. If you can get the fire through it two or three years in a row, you'll kill it. Um, a couple of the invasive grasses that we worry about. Um, brome, canary grass. Canary grass is its own thing. Canary grass actually is very susceptible to fire, but it just produces a gazillion seeds. And so every time it floods, it's gonna keep coming back. Brome's another one. You know, Fire will work on brome. I burned my little tiny pasture that I rented last year on May 7th because I wanted to get rid of the brome. And I shocked the goodness out of that brome and actually got a very nice flush then of clovers and things that came back underneath it because I burned before those things were active, but when the brome was actively growing. Brome is another thing that once, you know, it tends to, it produces a litter layer, but trying to burn it two years in a row, it doesn't quite put out enough biomass to get a couple, two, three good fires through it. But you can hit it pretty hard if you time it right. So, good. Yeah. Is uh, carbon in the air considered when you do your burns? Is carbon in the air considered when we do our burns? It is. And that is actually, you know, that's actually one of the criticisms that's out there. And it's, it's scientifically still kind of out there. There are people studying it pretty, pretty intensely. We know that, cer I mean, certainly burning, you're releasing carbon. I mean, that's in fact one of the things that we as fire managers have to worry about, especially if you're burning in like class one air shed. Right? You're worried about the amount of, of monoxide, you're worried about the things, the particulate matter and those things that you're putting in the air. Especially in a prairie system, I'm honestly not familiar with work done in woodland systems. But in prairie systems, you actually, th th that rapid regrowth that comes back very quickly, actually 
fixes 100 to 200% as much carbon as it releases. So because plants need carbon dioxide and they've got to pull carbon dioxide back out of the air for growth, you know, it's just the part of the photosynthesis reaction there, they're taking in carbon dioxide. Yeah, you release carbon when you burn it, but you may fix up to twice, if not more, carbon back into the soil just through the regrowth. So it's actually a net decrease in, in atmospheric carbon when, for grassland burning. I've not seen, you know, do, when you're doing woodland burning and, and forest fires and those sorts of things, they're releasing a lot more pent-up carbon when you're burning heavy, heavy biomass fuels. But in, at least in grassland situations, all the evidence points to that you will actually take more carbon out of the air than you put into it. And so it's a net, it's a net carbon sequestration. Yeah, in the back. Great question. His question was, when we're burning, do we have concerns for highly erodible lands, for soil erosion and those sorts of things? We do. We actually take that into consideration. It is very, I have seen it be a problem. Where you see it be a problem tends to be on your, um, your non-organic soils. And so most of what we deal with in the Midwest, actually fire is, is, uh, is not a problem. We don't have post-erosion problems. The worry is always we burned all that cover off and we get a two-inch rain the next day and it just washes that soil away. But very typically, you know, we have enough of a root base there that the root base is actually holding the soil just fine. Where it's a problem, you'll see it when you start to get into the rockier soils. Um, so you get into the Red Hills in Nebraska, you get into the Flint Hills. They worry about it some, but not too much. West Texas. Um, where you get into those more mineral soils and not so organically derived soils, there's a lot more fluidity in, in worried about the soil erosion afterwards. Are we going to get are we going to get a you know a soil loss after that? So, on HEL soils, I've I've honestly I've burned all across a lot of HEL soils and we've never seen an erosion problem. And we've there's actually I, I didn't actually ever work on it, but there's other researchers at the university who have at Iowa State who've looked at it over the years. What happens when you burn these things off? How much soil? How much sediment deposition is there into that adjacent creek? And it's, it's, it's not even detectable. It's not even a blip on their radar. What so. about burning it in part? We burn the top part first on this HEL land, burn the top. Mm -hmm. And when it greens up again, then burn the You can do, yeah. The it's again, it's another mitigate in time sort of thing. Yep. Up, the yep, it's another mitigate in time sort of thing. Yeah. Have you ever done a burn and had it, forget the pond, backfire on you where it, it did not meet your biological uh, wildlife? Objectives? Absolutely. So his question was, have we ever done a fire, have I ever been on a fire where it did not meet our ecological or wildlife or biological objectives? Absolutely. And that's kind of why it's more of an art than a science almost, right? It becomes kind of getting a feel for the landscape and a feel of what you want to do. Very often, and, and we're, every one of us, I have a little tiny, uh, a little tiny eight acres and stuff like that. We've done a lot of work with landowners and why they might burn, why they might not burn, why they might not use fire. Time constraints are a huge thing. And so, I mean, the reality is we got to burn it when we have time. Sometimes that's on a weekend. And you get the conditions that, okay, I can do a fire today. It may not be the time that's best for what you really want to do. What I always talk to people about is it, and, and it's, you know, those of us who work for agencies, those of, you know, those of you who are farmers, those of you who are landowners, we all get in such a, we've, got, we've all got stuff going on, right? The important thing to do, whether you're doing an herbicide application, whether you're doing a mowing, whether you're applying fire, what have you, go back two weeks later, go back a month later, go back two months later. Did it get the goals? And then think about why not, right? If you went in and you did your, you did your herbicide application, it just didn't hit the plant you wanted. Well, did I do it on a windy day? Did I do it on a wet day? It's, it's, it's that kind of that positive feedback loop, and it's difficult. It's difficult because, you know, you know, unless, like, when we, do, when we did some stuff at the university, we do it in a research sense. So we, you know, we had the luxury of sending students back out there to get the data. Did it do what we want to do? So you can kind of fine-tune it after, you know, it takes practice. That's why it's an art. After a few years, you start to see, well, it didn't, I burned on May 5th, and I didn't get what I wanted. What happens when I burn on April 20th? Did I get what I wanted by burning two weeks earlier? And you can kind of play with it like that. So good questions. Yeah. Pest like ticks, and is there a better time to do that? That question comes up frequently. His question was, can you eliminate ticks and pests and parasites like that? Um, it's so hit and miss because parasite and tick populations are so cyclical, right? Burning later in the spring seems like it does. 
Um, it seems like it does. We, it, it actually reduces tick in some of those, those pest populations. One thing that we know we've done, that we've known, is that if you're burning that fire, actually we can reduce fly loads on livestock pretty quickly with fire. We can actually cut like parasitic flies and you know just, just having flies out and about and around. That actually some of those flies over winter in the litter, and if, we, if we're through there and, and we come through and we burn, and we take care of that, we actually reduce the parasite load on livestock and stuff like that. So then by default, you'd think, well, by, or by logical extension, then you'd think, well, maybe we can affect that same thing. Not a lot has been done out there to see if there's fewer ticks per acre or, or per meter or whatever your measurement is um, to see if that actually happens. It seems like it is. It seems like later spring fires, once the ticks have kind of got, if you can get a complete burn, you tend to, you tend to reduce the tick load on stuff like that. So it's not really conclusive. It's more anecdotal. So good. I think that's probably what we have time for. So, good. Thank you.